thank you for um, inviting me to uh, talk today and on this very important day, PSC day. Um, I'm going to talk uh, briefly about the epidemiology of PSC and how it is sort of impacting our healthcare services, not just here in the United Kingdom where I'm based, but also more globally. So when people are diagnosed with PSC or when uh, healthcare professionals make that diagnosis, one of the first messages that are conveyed are about how rare it is. But what do we mean by that? So if we look at the incidence, that is the number of new cases of PSE, newly diagnosed people for every 100,000 people in the population, you can, it varies depending on where you live to 0.1 to 4.4 per 100,000 individuals. There are some studies which indicate a slightly higher incidence rate, up to sort of up to six per 100,000, but that's the sort of broad range that we're talking about here. The prevalence, that means the people who have already been diagnosed and are living with the disease is also indicated on screen, and that's a much larger range. And I'll talk about some of the factors that explain that variability. By contrast, hepatitis C virus infection, which is one of the commonest causes of chronic liver disease in the world, is magnitudes greater in terms of uh, um, its prevalence across the world, particularly in the West, but also in countries such as Egypt and the Far East, where we see even higher numbers. And we don't know why people get PSC, neither do we know why people develop other autoimmune conditions. But we do recognize certain common themes emerge. Now, the reason I illustrate this infographic here is just to highlight sort of not so much what we do understand, but also more so what we do not understand about the contributing factors. Thus far, despite a wealth of effort, there is not a single cause as to why people develop PSC, but we recognize that there are some genetic predisposing factors and certain environmental determinants. Now, the main environmental determinant that we've identified is that PSC invariably is a condition that is commoner in non-smokers. And we recognize that the genetic signals of PSC point to it being an autoimmune disease. And when we look at the different types of genetic signals um, in PSC, so these are gene variants that occur more commonly in people who have PSC compared to the general population who don't have evidence of liver disease or bowel disease. Many of them indicate that there are some problems with the mucosal immune system. So that's the immune system that uh, it helps control responses in the gut to our bacteria, to our fungi, to viruses that live there. There are some aberrant, some abnormal immune responses that occur to healthy gut microbes. And equally, there are some gut microbes that are there to a greater degree in people with PSC that shouldn't be there compared to other individuals. One of the questions that we're often asked in our clinic is about the risk to family members. And certainly when we look at the genetics, that only really explains less than 10% of, of the reasons why people get BSC. So despite the wealth of genetic work that we've done, we can only really explain PSC uh, and, uh, in relation to its genetics in about 10% of people. Now that does not mean that there is no risk to associated family, there certainly is a risk. And one of the sort of landmark studies to highlight this comes from my colleague Annika Berkwist, who you'll hear from later on, looking at the risk amongst first degree relatives. So that are that is brothers and sisters, parents and children. So if you're an individual with PSC, then a first degree relative has an 11 fold risk or sort of compared to the general population, your next door neighbor or sort of your work colleagues, they have an 11 fold risk of developing PSC themselves and a risk that's three more than three times greater of developing inflammatory bowel disease compared to somebody who is not related to you. The risk of either developing PSC or inflammatory bowel disease, if you have PSC only and no inflammatory bowel disease, is a little less. It's about 7.4, but nevertheless, greater 
than somebody who is not related. So there certainly is a greater risk of developing PSC in your family members, but it's not absolute. Now, this is a busy slide. And uh, the, what I, uh, uh, my intention of, of presenting it to you is to show across the world the incidence that is newly diagnosed cases of PSC it's sort of per year, per 100,000 population, it varies widely depending on where you look. Um, we certainly see the highest cases, newly diagnosed cases in the Northern Hemisphere, particularly Scandinavian countries. And we see much lower incidences of PSC in more Mediterranean climates, like in Italy, for example. We see much lower incidences of PSC in states of the uh, in, in North America, like California, compared to say in sort of states in uh, in, uh, in Canada. And the similar patterns is observed when we look at prevalence, when we look at the people who already have the disease and are living with PSC much higher rates in Scandinavian countries, much higher rates in some of the colder states of the United uh, in the US like Minnesota, compared to sort of more temperate climates. Now, most of these studies have been conducted in Europe, which I'm going to focus on in particular for the next half of the talk. And when you look at new diagnosis and people living with PSE, you can see that these cases are rising over the course of time. So we are seeing more and more people diagnosed with PSC um, than we did earlier on. Now, that might be due to the fact that our diagnostic capabilities have been enhanced. It may be because of increased awareness of the condition. But one of the questions that was asked when we, sort of, when we look at this data is, what does it look like when we compare with inflammatory bowel disease? So many of you will also have inflammatory bowel disease, either ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, and have asked, you know, is, you know, is the reason for PSE increasing because inflammatory bowel disease is increasing? So we did a study last year looking um, sort of across the whole of England, so not the whole of the UK, but certainly England as a standalone country. And that was mainly because of data access requirements. And what we saw was that actually parts of England, so we're a small country, but we could still see parts of England where inflammatory bowel disease cases were most commonly being diagnosed year on year differed to the parts of England where primary sclerosis and cholangitis was being diagnosed. Now this may suggest that there are different risk factors and that PSC with inflammatory bowel disease is very different to inflammatory bowel disease alone. But remember that lots of people who develop PSC don't get diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease at the same time and vice versa. So we're still learning a lot about this. One of the other things that we found, so on the left hand side, you'll see different types of inflammatory bowel disease over time. The rates of newly diagnosed inflammatory bowel disease, the lines are relatively smooth, relatively flat, not completely, but certainly it appears that inflammatory bowel disease incidence, new cases, has not really changed over a 10 year period. But, we're, but by comparison, and yes, the scale bars are different because PSE is rarer than inflammatory bowel disease. But you can see that there is certainly an increase in, in primary sclerosis and cholangitis with the inflammatory bowel disease types associated with it, um, which we don't see in people with inflammatory bowel disease alone. Now, one of my colleagues who works in Cambridge, Dr. Gwilym Webb, um, looked at all the listings for liver transplantation in primary sclerosis and cholangitis, as well as other immune mediated liver diseases. And what he showed uh, sort of over the duration of that 20 year study period was that certainly PSC, so that's the sort of the, the dashed line in the middle there, the listings for PSC and for autoimmune hepatitis seem to be increasing year on year in comparison to, in this case, primary biliary cholangitis. So we're certainly listing a lot more people uh, for transplantation with PSC. And when you look at data sort of elsewhere in Europe, so, you know, I, I like to show this Scandinavian example here. In the Nordic liver transplant program, transplantations, the number is going up year on year on year. And actually, PSC is the commonest indication for liver transplantation, despite it being a rare disease. Now, this really highlights the, not just the impact on healthcare service, 
but drives home the message we do need effective treatments that slow down the rate at which liver disease is progressing in PSC. Otherwise, all we're going to be doing is transplantation. Now, transplantation is an excellent treatment for PSE, but we do, you know, we what we want to see is medical therapy so people don't need to have it. The French group presented a similar study last year. Now, I don't expect people to sort of dissect this figure in detail, but just see at the bottom, these blue bars running across the bottom are the proportion of total transplants performed for PSC. And when we try to forecast over the course of time, by 2025, the majority of transplants in France um, sort of are going to be, you know, according to single indication, will be for PSC. So we're seeing this across the UK, we're seeing this across Scandinavian countries and in France, transplantations for PSC are increasing. Coming back to England now, one of the things that we did in our epidemiology study was to look at the risk of other factors compared to inflammatory bowel disease, other clinical events. And on the bottom here, you know, we've got what we call the HR, the hazard ratio, which is a measure of risk. The greater the number, the greater the risk. And no matter which of these clinical events you look for, whether it's death, the need for bowel surgery, development of bowel cancer, bile duct cancer, pancreatic cancer, liver cancer, so hepatocellular carcinoma, gallbladder cancer, or a need for, uh, for removal of um, uh, uh, gallbladder, so that's gallbladder surgery, the risk is greater than one for each of these and is greater in people with PSC compared to those with inflammatory bowel disease alone. So we're seeing more and more of these procedures in people with PSC than we're seeing in inflammatory bowel disease, despite it being a much rarer disease. And what are the reasons why we're doing bowel surgery? So on the left-hand side here, in red, you can see bowel surgeries performed in people with PSC as well as with IBD alone. And you can look at bowel surgery according to red for colorectal cancer and dark blue for non-colorectal cancer indication. So that, that is bowel surgery performed because the colitis is still very active. And you can see here that the main indication for performing bowel surgery in people with PSC is because inflammatory bowel disease activity is not controlled. And that is this case across all age groups. So we do need better inflammatory bowel disease treatment pathways um, as well as uh, for PSC. And when you look at the type of clinical events according to age, it is our younger pe people diagnosed with PSC that liver transplants and liver related deaths seem to sort of form the most clinical events. And in older age groups, non-PSC related illnesses tend to predominate. So PSC as a condition, it's important across all age groups, but particularly younger people, that's where we really need sort of, sort of excellent treatments for, because we have much greater life years to get out of these people's livers. These are the people where PSC is making the most dent in their quality of life and quantity of life. But what can we sort of, what are the positives? What can we do? So I mentioned that there's not that many treatments for PSC. In fact, there are no licensed medical therapies at the moment, but many of you with inflammatory bowel disease undergo annual colonoscopy. And that's because at a young age, there is a high risk of, of bowel cancer. But when we look at the group of people who undergo surveillance, the risk of death from bowel cancer is much lower in people who undergo surveillance colonoscopy compared to groups of people who don't undergo surveillance. So it drives home the message that surveillance is changing outcomes. And just as in the last couple of slides to finish off, you know, we are starting to learn that men and women with PSC have differences. Women with, P <coughs> with PSC tend to be diagnosed at an older age, more commonly with Crohn's disease. And with variant phenotypes, you know, small duct PSC or PSC with overlapping features of autoimmune hepatitis. And thankfully in women, the risks of transplantation and PSC related deaths are about 25% lower than we see in men. But please don't forget, sort of ladies and gentlemen, inflammatory bowel disease can manifest before your PSC at the same time or after and about 40% of people are diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease 
after PSC first manifest. So that's why it's important to keep an eye on symptoms. And if your doctor advises you to undergo a colonoscopy many years after your PSC diagnosis, there is a reason for it. And finally, just to finish off, you know, many of you undergo surveillance uh, scans, ultrasounds, MRI scans. These are making a difference. We know, just like with colonoscopy, you know, those people who undergo surveillance, uh, um, you know, for um, uh, bile duct cancers, pancreatic cancers, have a much better survival in the event cancer is diagnosed than those people who do not undergo surveillance. So the incidence of death from cancers is lower in people who undergo scanning. So that is something that we've learned from epidemiology studies and that surveillance is important. So thank you for, for your attention. It is not all doom and gloom because there are some excellent treatment trials sort of on the horizon, which we'll hear about later on. And, you know, and I'm not gonna labor about sort of the mechanisms of actions of these drugs, but they are tackling multiple different pathways of PSC. And it is certainly a very intriguing time to sort of be researching PSC. And I hope that you will continue to work with us. Uh, and uh, and we, will, uh, we look forward to working with you, uh, not just on PSC day, but uh, in the future. Thank you.